For the video version of this podcast, please visit our YouTube channel, Daughters of the American Revolution National Headquarters. Otherwise, please enjoy this audio podcast on your favorite streaming service. It's a privilege to be able to serve. I think personally, it's an opportunity to share, to share your life and to share your understanding of people and events and to make people feel like they belong and that they're welcome. Well, it's almost spring, friends. Everything is waking up, ourselves included. Everyone is venturing outside a bit more, and for many, that means a bit more helping out in their communities. That certainly rings true for DAR members. In fact, that's what we'll hear about today, the incredible amount of service our daughters are doing in their communities. I do love a good quote to make you think. How about this one? We work for a cause, not for applause. Or, one of my favorites, Don't ever question the value of volunteers. Noah's Ark was built by volunteers. The Titanic was built by professionals. This is also the time for announcements and news about what's coming up. In fact, we wanted to share a bit with you now, but a quick reminder before we do. Remember to subscribe to this podcast and hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. The National Society is pleased to announce that women aged 18 or older who can prove lineal descent from an ancestor who served with the Spanish military on the island of Cuba between June 1779 and September 1783 are now eligible for membership. This important change opens the opportunity of membership to more women of Spanish ancestry. Service for regular military or militia in Cuba previously included only those participating in the Galvez expedition. There has been considerable scholarly research on Spain's role to support the colonists during the last century. This research now allows the National Society to recognize the larger role played by Spain militarily, financially, and strategically with the success of the American Revolution. The National Society recognizes the significant work of Mary Anthony Starts, National Chair, Specialty Research Committee, and Molly Fernandez de Mesa, National Vice Chair, Specialty Research Committee, to research and bring forward this expansion of eligible Revolutionary War service. The assistance of Janine Dobbins, National Chair DAR Genealogy Commission, and the leadership of Registrar General Rhonda Kren is also gratefully acknowledged. For more information, visit the Specialty Research Committee webpage found on our national website, dar.org. The new Patriots Abroad Insignia Pin is now available in our DAR Insignia store. This commemorative pin recognizes the support provided by Patriots and governments abroad to those who struggled for American independence. This pin may be purchased and worn by all DAR members. Show your support by adding it to your insignia collection today, of course, while supplies last. As you may be aware by now, we've been interviewing the members of our executive committee, those members who serve, who volunteer their time at the national level of our society. I really hope you've enjoyed getting to know them as much as I have. Stay tuned for our next guest as we have a very personal chat with our Chaplain General. We're speaking today with Virginia Lingelbach, who serves as our Chaplain General for the Wright Administration. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Virginia. Well, thank you, Brooke, and welcome to the office of the Chaplain General. Even though it's not my beautiful office in Washington, D.C., as you can see, it's my somewhat cluttered office here in middle Georgia. But I'm so happy to speak with you today. It's a real honor. Absolutely. I think we all have offices like that, those of us who are very busy, right? (laughs) I think so. 
Well, why don't you tell us, especially for members of the public who don't know, what are the roles of the chaplain general within our society? Well, Brooke, I will tell you, it's the best job in the society. Um, I do not have a staff. Like I said, I do have a lovely office, but I do not have a staff. So all of the duties of the office of the chaplain general are carried out by the chaplain general. And of course, it's the things that you normally expect of the chaplain general. Um, it's the planning for wreath laying ceremonies. It's sending birthday greetings to our daughters who reached the 90th birthday, their 100th birthday and beyond. Sending condolence cards to members of the members and past members of the National Board of Management who um, are deceased. And it's planning and, and conducting the wreath lanes and the plaque dedications and so forth. Right now, for instance, I'm working on a wreath lane for Mount Vernon for the tomb of George and Martha Washington. I'm also working on the wreath lane for Arlington, which will probably occur the week before Continental Congress. And actually I'm working on things that are um, out as far as October. So the chaplain general stays very busy. I'm also rewriting the chaplain general's handbook and making all of the plans for our lovely memorial service at Continental Congress. So it's a full-time job. Sounds but amazing. I, <laughs> it, it is. It, it's a labor of love. But Brooke, I think many of the daughters probably do not understand the duties of the national executive officers. So if I could take a moment to explain that as well. First, of course, the 12 of us do the jobs that we are elected to do. And in my case, of course, that is the duties of the chaplain general. But in addition to that, serving on the executive committee, um, we weigh in on every recommendation, every issue, and every motion that comes forth from our 50-something committees. Some of those issues will continue on to the National Board of Management. Some of them then will continue on further to the delegates at Continental Congress. Mm -hmm. So every issue, every motion, every ruling that is brought forward by a committee comes to the executive committee. Thirdly, this is pretty much a, a three-prong job as I see it. And lastly, thirdly, we serve as executive liaisons to various committees. Mm -hmm. I serve as the executive liaison to six committees. So we stay pretty busy the whole time. Um, everything they do comes through their executive liaison for approval to include articles for the daughter's newsletter. So as I said, the executive officers have a three-prong job, the job they're elected to do, serving on the executive committee and serving as executive liaison. So it truly is a labor of love, but it is a busy labor of love. And Brooke, one other thing I'd like to mention, um, the executive committee does meet in person, scheduled five times a year at other times when the president general needs us to come to Washington. So we do meet in Washington five times a, uh, a year and we meet by Zoom every week. So we are busy ladies all the time. Absolutely. Now, with all of these things that you're doing as chaplain general, is, it, is there one particular moment or maybe a couple of them that stick out in your mind in, in your role as chaplain general? Well, uh, so many, so many, actually. But there are two occasions that are close to my heart. Um, the first year of a, new, of a new administration, the chaplain general is invited to speak to um, Cathedral of the Pines. And so I was agonizing about what I would speak on. And after much prayerful search, I remembered meeting a lady uh, at the Walter Hines Page chapter in England. And um, her story was so touching. Her great grandfather was Horatio Spofford, the man that wrote the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And she had shared some personal family information and stories with me. And so I made that into my talk for, use that as the basis of my talk for Cathedral of the Pines. And um, I called it a legacy of faith because truly Horatio Spofford's faith did continue for many, many years uh, through his family. And he left that great legacy. And our members were very, very touched by that story, which in turn was very touching to me. 
And a second opportunity I had, um, I was asked to speak briefly at the Traveling Vietnam Wall. And um, so I thought again, my goodness, what, what will I say to those, to those men and women? And it made me think about my own family history. My grandfather served in World War I in the Alsace-Lorraine area in France. My daddy served in World War II in Guadalcanal. He suffered both uh, emotional and physical trauma. My um, late husband was an Air Force pilot doing three tours in Vietnam. And my current husband served a tour in Vietnam. And my son-in-law served in the Gulf War, um, establishing, he was a flight surgeon, establishing a hospital in Amman. So I think it's easy for you to understand where my sentiments lie. Um, so speaking to the um, men and women at the Vietnam Wall, it was so touching. And I think one of the things that amazed me they were thanking me <laughs> for the service that my family had contributed over over more than a century. Um, so it was just an amazing, um, heartfelt moment for me and, and for my husband as well. So I would say those those two things since I've been chaplain general have been very significant and very poignant with me. Hmm. Isn't it interesting when you go to speak sometimes to other groups, how much those groups in turn end up blessing you, right? Yes. And they speak yes. to you. It was it was so amazing. And uh, like, I, I think I spent more time cry, crying than they did. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, for those who don't know that Cathedral of the Pines, that's an event in New Hampshire every year. Yes, right? it is. Yes, I've it had is. the honor of being able to attend that because I'm an associate member of a New Hampshire chapter. So that's a really wonderful, wonderful event. An absolutely beautiful place to get to, uh, to, to be at, but not an easy place to get to. Yeah. <laughs> but well but well worth it and I would recommend it if anybody has the opportunity please try to go yeah and bring your hat <laughs> definitely want bring, to wear a hat. bring your Kentucky Derby hat exactly. or your church hat <laughs> tell, us, yeah, tell us a little bit about you um you know growing up that kind of thing my daddy as I mentioned earlier he was a marine and we uh I was born in California but grew up pretty much in Georgia and North Carolina. So my home has been Georgia um, for most of my life. Um, as far as DAR, um, I'm a chapter member of the Suki Heart chapter in Warner Robins, Georgia. And I'm a life member and a legacy member of DAR. Um, and I don't mind telling you, I am the oldest member on the executive committee. And I have been in DAR more than half of my life. <laughs> So I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of the more than half of my life part anyway. On the personal side, um, I think it's important for daughters to understand the, that the role of the chaplain general, in my opinion, is one of compassion, kindness, understanding, and love as well. And uh, I think it helps the daughters to relate to you if they know that you have experienced some of life's fullness, some of life's ups and downs. Um, so I, I will tell a little bit about my life. I have four grown children, three daughters who are members of DAR. I have seven grandchildren and two of those are members of DAR. And I have four great grandchildren, um, three of whom are mixed race. Asian and African American. They're not yet old enough to be in DAR, but we're working on CAR. <laughs> nice. And um, I've been widowed twice. And actually, I'm a newlywed. Uh, I just, we were married last April after I'd been a widow for 12 years. So, so never say never, you know. <laughs> wow. Um, in my professional life, I had a 30 year career with the federal government where I was uh, worked in the area of human resources, which I think in a lot of ways helps me with my DAR work because I am on the human resources committee for the National Society. And um, in my free time, my husband and I are building a house on our lake property. So uh, what little free time I have, I've been picking out appliances and light fixtures and you know, paint colors and that sort of thing. So I think that kind of uh, sums up my, my life a little bit that um, it's, as I said earlier, I think it's important 
that the daughters know that for someone in this position, you have experienced some ups and downs in the fullness of life and, and dealt with tragedy and happiness and, you know, all that goes along with the way our lives play out. Thank you for asking me that question. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a pleasure to get to know you better. And and I guess it, I, hand in hand, I think, with that question and that answer that you gave, what would be your why then for why you, with the, the full life that you have, the, you know, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, <laughs> holding the home, you know, new husband, um, what's your why in volunteering your time this way for, for DAR? Well, Brooke, I... Um... I think our why, our why in DAR is always about service. Mm -hmm. uh, we are privileged to be able to serve our communities, to serve our school children, to serve education, to serve our veterans. Um, just, it's a privilege to be able to serve. I think personally, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's an opportunity to share, to share your life and to share your um understanding of people and events and um, to make the people feel like they belong and that they're welcome. Um, I told of what I thought was a cute, funny story. We didn't have a DAR chapter in my town. And my sister called me one day and said she wanted her, her bridge club was going to start a DAR chapter. And would I help her with her genealogy, her genealogy? Well, I had always been sort of the keeper of the family records, the Bibles and, you know, little scraps of paper and things that your grandma passes down. So I said, yes, I would help her with her papers. And but I kept thinking, you know, why didn't she ask me? M maybe the the regent will call me and ask me. She didn't want to ask me. Well, come to find out they didn't ask me because I didn't play bridge. <laughs> so I have always felt like. You know, I, I know Title VII of the Civil Rights Act probably does not talk about bridge as a discriminating factor, but I have always felt that there are women out there like me who couldn't belong because of some contrived notion. They don't play bridge or they don't have the right hat or, or whatever. So I take it as a personal mission, so to speak, to make people know that we want you. We want you. We want you to belong. We want you to serve. We want to put you in positions of responsibility and leadership. This is an organization for everybody that can prove their lineage. I think that's my why. Mm -hmm. I think so, especially in, in in what you your particular position, you know, to to show your heart that way and to let people know. I think we talked about that before. You don't have to fit in this mold of what we think a DAR member looks like. If you have the lineage, as you mentioned, then you are DAR, just as I am DAR. Well, exactly. And the other part of that story, the Bridge Club chapter, as I call it, did, did not actually ever um, organize. No surprise there. So some, um, I guess a year or two later, someone called me and said, we're going to start a DAR chapter. And they did invite me to join. So I was very you know, honored. And I said, well, I almost have the papers ready. Big surprise, you know, because I've been working on my sister's papers. And when I said I almost, my daddy didn't have a birth certificate because he was born in 1919 and in Georgia, births weren't recorded back then. So when I went over to ask him about getting a delayed birth certificate and he said, well, why do you need that? And I said, well, I've been invited to join the DAR. And he was like, the DAR? And I said, do you even know what the DAR is? And he said, well, of course I do. Well, as it turns out, back in the 20s when he was in school, the matrons and the, you know, blue-blooded dowagers, I suppose, would come to his school, all dressed to the nines. And that's all he knew about the DAR. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, no, they're not going to let you in. And my feelings were so hurt, Brooke. My wow. feelings were hurt for years and years. And then finally, I realized he didn't want me hurt. He knew I could join. Hmm. He didn't think I belonged. And that is what I don't want people to feel like today. Yes, you can join. And yes, you do belong. If you, if you can join, you belong and we want you. I did get in the DAR, obviously, <laughs> and I did get the birth certificate. Without his help, I might add. And then guess what, Brooke? What? I got my sister in. <laughs> 
<laughs> I hope she enjoys being a member. That'd be great. <laughs> yes, she does. Uh, well, I, I love that that is the goal with Mrs. Wright as well, is that, that feeling of inclusiveness that, you know, that we are all DIR together, you know, regardless of the differences between us, we're all DIR together. So, well, absolutely. And I was ashamed to tell that story about my daddy not helping. For years, I was ashamed that he, you know, I was just ashamed of that. And then one day I was like, well, he was really trying to save me from being hurt. Absolutely. Because, you know, I was a young girl. I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have the clothes or the, you know, and he just, well, they're not going to let you in. So, uh, but we're going to let everybody in. The exactly. <laughs> and we want, and we yeah. want them to. Absolutely. Well, I love getting to speak with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time with me. And uh, I, I, I'm sure our members um, are just delighted to have heard from you as well. So thank well, you. Well, it was a real joy. And I'm so glad we finally found the time to get together. It's pretty hectic for both of us when we we're in Washington. And um, this has been lovely. Thank you again. Thank you so much. much. Bye bye. Early in the development of our society, one of our founding members, Eugenia Washington, declared that we would be a society founded upon service. It's in that spirit that the Service to America Committee was formed. Jamie Birchfield serves as the national chair of this committee during the Wright administration, and we recently got to sit down and talk about the incredible work daughters are doing. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your committee, the Service to America Committee, and also maybe, I think even more importantly, the significance of what that means, uh, the, what's happening in your committee. Absolutely, Brooke. It's such a great uh, pleasure to be here. And so the Service to America Committee um, really just tries to encompass all of the service work our daughters do. And service and DAR is not a new idea. Some of the first acts of DAR was, you know, during the Spanish-American War, we um, trained more than 1,000 nurses. And so we have a more than 130 history enriched in service. And in the Young Administration, President General um, Young decided to introduce and celebrate that service by first bringing this committee as the Celebrate America Committee, which then transitioned to the Service to America Committee. And its main goal is just truly to um, capture and celebrate the service that our daughters are doing all across America. I know myself, I, I enter my hours, right? We all enter our hours and what we're doing. And um, what are you finding that, you know, as far as the amount of hours that daughters are spending, um, what, what are those numbers kind of range? Oh my goodness, it is amazing. So when Mrs. Young originally introduced this initiative, she thought it would be great if we could get 1 million hours of service a year. Well, daughters, um, quickly exceeded that goal. And so adjustments have been made. For the Wright administration, we have a goal of 15 million hours recorded for the entire administration. And I am just so thrilled to be able to report that we are well on our way to achieving that. In 2022, daughters logged more than 6.5 million hours, which is the most ever to be recorded with 1.5 of that being um, during the Van Buren administration and 5 million being during the Wright administration. So daughters logged our goal for the year within six months. It's just <laughs> astounding what daughters are doing in their communities. These are definitely not just ladies who lunch, are they? They're out. No. Making a difference I don't know that it. these ladies have time to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So speaking of the right administration, are there new things that are goals or um, programs or projects within the right administration? Yes, we have launched two exciting new initiatives with the start of the right administration administration. The first was the introduction of our annual project, and that really paid homage to the work that daughters did in the early stages of the pandemic when we were all stuck at home and everyone was sewing masks, and we provided more than a million pieces of per personal protection equipment um, all across the country. And so looking at how that brought us together, and we were able to really quantify that, that service and provide a tangible um, product, 
we decided to do an annual project that will rotate between historic preservation, patriotism, and education. So our first year is historic preservation, and we are currently encouraging daughters, and this is service that they were already doing. Um, this isn't anything new by any means, but we've never really counted. And so we are trying to quantify the number of headstones that daughters are cleaning in cemeteries and the number of beautification projects that they are undertaking in cemeteries. And honestly, to date, we've had more than 10,000 headstones cleaned this year in over 400 cemeteries. And we're just getting started. The second initiative yes, is our service and seconds initiative. And this is an activity that we think about as a daughter, as a person, if you sat down and clipped coupons for veterans for 20 minutes, you're doing a lot of great work, but you're not really going to make a huge a huge contribution yourself. But if you sat down with 20 of your closest friends and chapter members and clip coupons for 20 minutes, think about the magnitude of that service. And so service in seconds is really there to demonstrate the amount of good that can be done in a short amount of time. These projects are hands-on projects of your choosing, um, but they need to be taken down, be, you need to be able to complete them in 20 minutes or less. And it's a great substitution for a chapter program. We're not asking you to do this in, you know, at a chapter meeting, in addition to all of the many things you have to accomplish. But what fun would it be to have a service project, maybe in October during the annual day of service, that you hands on do together? Because um, that, you know, you bond when you do service together. And so those hands on projects. And we're just really thrilled to see what chapters and states can do at their meetings with these quick little service projects and the difference that we're going to make. It'll be exciting, I think, perhaps in a future um, podcast, maybe we can feature some of those headstone cleanings or um, other kind of projects like that. It'd be kind of neat. Maybe you'll come back. Absolutely. I know for our chapter, one of the things that we did like that together um, was the pocket flags and folding those. And that was so neat because we all told stories um, about the different service that our family members had done and um, talked about what we were looking forward to in DAR. And it was just a really neat day. So I can really appreciate an initiative like this. I think it could really bring chapters together in such a tangible way. Like you said, doing service together is just even better than doing it by yourself. Oh, absolutely. Now, to do all of this, you probably have a tremendous team. <laughs> Would you tell us about your national vice chairs and what they do? I have a fantastic team of national vice chairs who are supporting all of the millions of hours that daughters are logging through our many initiatives and work. Um, so my national vice chairs are Erica Cooper, Annalise Griego, Gretchen McGee, and Aubrey Williams, and they do all of those little projects that always come up uh, at the last moment. They are my special projects gals and I couldn't do it without them. And then we have our annual project national vice chair team, um, which is Laura Bison and Heather Curtis and Beth Mosher. And they are the ones counting all of those headstones that everyone's submitting and uh, pushing out that information. And then we have our Congress event vice chair, Kelly Clark, our contest vice chairs for day of service is Stephanie Helley and Mary Barrow for um, service in seconds because there is a contest for that new initiative. And then for our hours reporting is Diana Raz. Our salute to service, which is a continuation from the Van Buren administration, is Teresa Ayler. And then our wonderful social media vice chairs that do all of those fun graphics that you see on Facebook and the doc are um, Angela Garrett and Kristen Dubois. That's tremendous. It's a lot of work happening, even just did it within your community. <laughs> so that's <laughs> kind of neat. Well, thank you so much for being here. And we can't wait to hear what daughters are doing. Kind of can't wait to hear what that annual project will be next year. Do you know when you'll announce that? Will it be in this coming December or? It, it will be announced at Continental Congress. Um, so we, we will wrap up our historic preservation um, project at Continental Congress and make that grand announcement of how many headstones we have cleaned and how many cemeteries we have supported, and then simultaneously launch our education-based um, project um, and we're following up with patriotism the last year of the administration. That's so exciting, especially given our President General's theme of celebrate stars and stripes forever. So thank you again, Jamie. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Brooke.
We do hope that you've been able to visit the DAR Museum in Washington, D.C. We got to recently have a chat with William Strollo, the DAR Museum Curator of Exhibitions, about something new that's coming Thank up. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure to be here. Now, we have a brand new book that mm -hmm. is going to be available in the gift shop. Can you tell us about that? Yes, this is the catalog that will accompany our next exhibition called Pleasing Truths, Power and Portrait in the American Homes. This is really a supplement to the exhibition. It has uh, three essays by scholars that really build on what we talk about in the exhibition, but also all of the images that will be uh, hung in the gallery for the run of the, of the show. It's a beautiful book too. How did this come about? Every now and then the museum will do a catalog to accompany its exhibitions. Um, so we haven't done one on portraits in, in uh, the time the museum's been open, so we we're really looking forward to doing that. And then we had the generous support of the junior membership committee to help with the production of this, as well as the design for an interactive in the exhibition, as well as an art program to go along with the exhibition. Tell us about that interactive part. What is that? The interactive will be a touch screen in the exhibition gallery and visitors will be able to walk up to it and create their own portrait based on portraits that are in the exhibition. So they can take elements, they can take faces and um, different features, different symbols in the, ex in the portraits and create their own portrait from that. I think everybody is going to love that part, right? It's, <laughs> I think the interactives are always popular. a lot of fun. That's really neat. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you can tell us about the exhibition itself? The exhibit opens on Friday, March 17th here at the DAR Museum uh, in Washington, D.C., and it'll run through the rest of the calendar year. And then uh, in the coming months, we'll also have a virtual version for anyone who's not able to get out here. They can, uh, they can see the exhibition online or they can purchase the catalog through the DAR Museum store. Do we know how much that catalog is going to be? This catalog retails for $35. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much for being here with You're us. You're welcome. As we mentioned, the DAR Museum is a part of our DAR headquarters buildings at 1776 D Street Southwest. Check out the website for hours and current exhibitions. And for DAR members, how can you get more involved? Well, log into members.dar.org and look specifically at the DAR Museum Outreach Committee pages. The new exhibit William mentioned will be running in our museum while we're all visiting this summer for Continental Congress. We'll see you there. We're speaking today with Michelle Cousins Weary, who's the National Chair of the Community Service Awards for DAR. Thank you so much for being here today, Michelle. Brooke, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about Community Service Awards. We, as a committee, are focused on acknowledging and recognizing individuals and teams in a community for all the volunteer work that they selflessly do and never get recognized for. And we want to recognize them. That is our committee. That's wonderful. I think a lot of people in the public and even maybe some of our members don't know what that is. So what does that look mm -hmm, like for mm -hmm. a chapter to do this for a, someone or a, a group, as you mentioned? Correct. The Community Service Awards in a chapter, we want our chapter members to be able to recognize individuals and teams in their community, to recognize those selfless volunteers. If it's a team, maybe it's in the schools, you know, and you've got booster groups, or you have parents that volunteer, um, you know, their time, their efforts, their money to enrich the lives of the, not just their children, but of the school and the community as a whole. On the individual side, you would have someone that's in a um, affiliated with a park and maybe they spearheaded a program to help a garden for the community, a vegetable, you know, plots, et cetera, to enrich the community, to help their community. This is the type of spirit that we want to recognize. And our job as the national committee with our division vice chairs, our state chairs, and on into our chapter committee leaders is to recognize these wonderful selfless individuals and teams. We see what they do and we recognize them for that and appreciate them for that.
Now, of course, our chapter regents just filled out their CMR, which is their chapter master report. But your committee, of course, is located within the Chapter Achievement Awards. Why don't you tell me about that? And how exciting that it is that this year, the 2022 report in the CAA has an opportunity to receive five or 25 points for the chapter. That means that when a chapter presents two awards, you know, get, they automatically will get five points. But if they give those awards at an event, then they have an opportunity to receive 25 points for their chapter. That is amazing to me. We want chapters to not only look at community service awards as something to do, but they are also going to be rewarded for their chapter for doing this. And this is what we, this is the culture that we want to generate. That not only are you, you're so proud of this person, you're so proud of this team, you know, you're going to incorporate this, whether it's at a, a chapter meeting, if you're, um, if you're hosting and you're going to, you know, bring several members, you know, to recognize this team or this individual, that's an event. And as such, when you do that, when you recognize people for their kindness, you know, you in turn, in kind, receive something that's beneficial for your chapter. And I would imagine in recognizing all of these wonderful chapters and everything that you do in this committee, you must have some wonderful national vice chairs, a great team. Why don't you tell us about them? Oh, we absolutely do. We absolutely do have a wonderful team that they exemplify Mrs. Wright's administration for just sparkling individuals. Oh my goodness, they just sparkle. Linda Rhodes Jones is one of our national vice chairs. And Nikki Williams Sebastian is also our national vice chair. Nikki is our national vice chair for communications. And Linda is my right arm. She helps me immeasurably. We also have eight division vice chairs and they are absolutely amazing. So just remember, chapters can present two community service awards per DAR calendar year, and each state can present two awards per DAR calendar year. So go out and sparkle in your community because the gems are there. The gems are there. Thank you so much for being here today, Michelle. Really appreciate your committee, everything you guys do. And I love that chapters can recognize so many people in their communities along with your leadership to guide them. Thank you, Brooke. Do you have someone in mind for a community service award? I hope these two examples of exemplary volunteers give you inspiration to recognize the everyday heroes that are making a difference in our communities. Mary Bracey, the regent of the Halifax Convention Chapter in Charlotte, North Carolina, knew that Rosella Bergen was a prime candidate for the Community Service Award. Rosella's commitment to others is an inspiration to all. She's a Brownie Troop leader, president of the Salvation Army Women's Auxiliary, hospice volunteer, bereavement minister, baby bundles ambassador, and the list goes on. Rosella has filled her life with acts of service. The Nellie Custis chapter in Mount Vernon, Virginia, has reminded us all that recognition of kindness and service can uplift and make an impact on a prospective chapter member. It took six years for Cheryl Sims to go from being a prospective member to a daughter in our society. Cheryl could have given up, but the chapter encouraged her to attend meetings. And while Cheryl waited for her documents and application to be approved, she volunteered by helping to set up meetings and cleaned and indexed graves alongside other chapter members. Mrs. Sims cleaned the Vietnam War Memorial Wall, attended funeral services for soldiers without families, attended honor flights, and worked on the chapter's quilts of valor to name just a few of the ways that Mrs. Sims stayed involved with the chapter. 
Former chapter regent Mary Beth Cutting and the chapter members acknowledged Mrs. Sims' selflessness by presenting her with a Community Service Award certificate and pin. This chapter created a sense of belonging and gained not just Mrs. Sims as a chapter member, but possible family members and friends of Mrs. Sims, as she related such a positive experience of belonging to the society. A huge thank you to Mary Bracey, regent of the Halifax Convention chapter, and to former chapter regent Mary Beth Cutting for this information about these incredible women. We congratulate and celebrate all chapters and volunteers out there who are working to make the world a better place. We appreciate you. We leave you with this quote by the American treasure, Irma Bombeck. Volunteers are the only human beings on the face of the earth who reflect this nation's compassion, unselfish caring, patience, and just plain loving one another. Well, thanks for listening and be well, dear friends. Let's celebrate the stars and stripes forever and remember, with all of your ancestors behind you, you are the result of the love of thousands. This podcast was written and produced by our incredible team of writers and editors, and we are, as always, so grateful for President General Pamela edwards rouse Wright and Historian General Suzanne Heskey for their constant guidance. To Virginia Lingelbach, William Strollo, Jamie Birchfield, and Michelle Weary for being so generous with their time. The National Society Daughters of the American Revolution is a nonprofit, nonpolitical, volunteer women's service organization dedicated to promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and securing America's future through better education for children. Members are all lineal descendants of those who supported the cause of independence in the Revolutionary War. For more information, please visit DAR.org. This is the DAR Today podcast.